Hello everyone, this is Prem Kumar. In this video, I'm going to explain you how to use a service package rule in Pega. Service package is not a rule, it is a data instance. From the name itself, we can say that it helps to package the services. Pega can act as a service provider. It can use different service rules like service rest, service soap, service file, and all the service rules can be packaged under a service package instance. So what does the service package instance really provides? If you look at this, all these functionalities or responsibility that service package takes. The first thing is it packages the service. It means related services can be grouped under a service package. For our client's request application, for now, I'm going to have only one service package created. I will call it as client's app services and that will hold all the services that I create under client's app application. If you have different kinds of data types, if you have a very big stack of application, you can very well create multiple service packages to group the related service packages under those individual service package. The next is it provides the access for rule execution. So what do you mean by providing access? Let's take an example like I am logging into the client's application. Now I have an access group and with the access group, I get point to an application and that application is where I get access to. In the background processing video, we already saw all those background processing jobs or the schedulers, they use the batch requesters. So it means they also get assigned to some access group and that access group is determined by the user who queues or the configuration that is done in the agent rule form or the job scheduler rule form. So this is how the access is determined. This is how the rules can be executed. Now let's come to the services. Services is also kind of a backend think it like a background processing because there is no end users involved. Pega also has its own requester types. It is called as app requesters. It starts with A and it is totally dedicated for the services. So definitely for these requesters, you need to have an access group. So who provides this access group? Service package provides it. So in service package, you need to define an access group that helps with providing the access for these services, especially for the rule execution. The next is the main important one. You can configure whether it is stateless or stateful. So what is the main difference between the stateless and stateful? Let me give you a scenario for the stateful. Let's say you have an application to online purchase. So you can create different services that can invoke and create different objects. Let's say you do purchase order and then you also want to make a payment. Both these are kind of service exposed. Now, if you make the services as stateful, what it meant is like, first I create the purchase request service, I get some details and in Pega, all those details are stored into clipboard or some pages, right? Now, when I hit the next service, the pages are still maintained for that requester. It means the second service can use the data from the first service. This is what we call it as stateful mechanism. And stateful mechanism, we can use it really if you want to share the clipboard data between different service kits. And note that stateful service package comes with some kind of performance issue because you need to maintain all this clipboard. If you make it stateless, let's say a service comes in, the service package, it creates a browser requester, it, it assigns an access group, it creates a clipboard structure. Once that is done, it cleans up the clipboard. So none of the pages will be maintained for the next service request. So by default, Pega uses the stateless. If you really want, you can go for the stateful. The fourth option is it provides security to the services. We already saw during the introduction, if we are the service provider, we determine everything. We determine the request response for the services and we also determine the authentication mechanism. And how Pega provides the authentication for the services, every service mandatorily you should go under service package and you will be configuring the authentication under the service package. Let's say you have a basic authentication enabled for the service package, then all the services that are part of the service package use the same authentication mechanism. The next is the service monitoring as well as deployment. In the service package, you can also see some invocation history. You can turn off the monitoring on or off, or you can also check the visitor files that got created when you use the service SOAP under the package. So these helps with the deployments as well as monitoring. And finally, requester pooling. Now we know that services can be handled by the app requesters and definitely we need to have some kind of pooling mechanism for it. You cannot use all your resources, all your app resources only for this service package. So you have to define like, 
I can have maximum 10 active requesters processing these services. So this is also one of the key thing. I'm going to explain in detail when we look at the configurations. Now it's time. Let's go to Disney Studio and create a new service package and check different configurations of the service package. Let's get started. So here I have logged in into the Disney Studio and service packages are part of the integration resources. As you can see, there are four main categories, integration connectors, which hold all the connect rules and integration services, which hold all the service rules. We also have integration mapping, which we will slowly see in the videos. We have different type of mappings. For example, if you have XML message format, we have XML mappings. And then if we have some kind of file formats, then we have separate mappers for it. And then under the integration resources, you will have different types of resources. Like you can have file listener, email account, email listeners, the MDB listeners, all those listeners and servers, they come under this integration resources and service package is part of the integration resources. Let's open it to check the list of service packages that already exist in the system. As you can see, Pega also ships with a lot of service packages because a lot of services are involved in build. The notable service package is the API service package because in this API service package, you will have the list of Pega APIs that you can also find it from the admin studio. If you scroll down, you will find all these APIs like the application related APIs, the assignment related APIs. All these are packaged under the service package API. If you have some time, you can take a look at this. But now we will start with creating our own service package. I'm going to name it as clients app services. So let's start with that. Go to create form, integration resources, and then service package. As you can see the create form, it doesn't ask for any kind of rule set or rule set version because it is not a rule instance. It is a data instance. So you don't need to provide some kind of version control for it. I'm going to name it like this clients app services. This is fine. Then create and open. So here you get the two main tabs, which you can configure on your own, the context tab and the pooling tab. First context tab, let's determine the processing mode. As I told already, if you want to have stateful session, you can very well have with this configuration. Or if you want to have stateless session, you can very well do it. That is the default configuration. If you don't want to maintain the state between different incoming records, you don't need to have it as stateful. You can always have it as stateless. The next is we already saw we are going to use an access group to provide the access for the rule execution. So what can be the service access group here? Definitely this access group should be pointing to the client's application. I would recommend you to create your own access group for your services so that it has the right access or right access role. But for now, I'm just going to use this client's app administrator. This is fine for now because it points to the client's app application. So I get all the rules that are part of the client's app application. The next is authentication block. Here you can use whether to have authentication or not. By default, Pega recommends to have the require authentication. So you can very well have it. And then in the authentication type, you can define whether you need to have a basic authentication. So what do you mean by basic authentication here? So basic authentication refers to normal username and password. If you open any browser session, how do you log in? How do you authenticate yourself? You provide the username and password. Similarly, all the service packages also can be authenticated with the basic authentication of username and password. But do not use any end users username password or the developers username password. Just create a dedicated username and password for this and then use the basic authentication. And also in the operator rule form, you can configure not to use checkout or you can also configure this is an unattended robot so that it is used only for the authentication service. No one can use that username and password to log in or do some other illegal activities. Ideally, no one will do that. But just I'm saying, don't use your name for the username and password, which I'll be doing because only for this demo, but in real time, have a dedicated username and password if you are using basic authentication. OAuth is a bit advanced topic. I'm not going to explain much in detail, but you can also have custom authentication where you can use some kind of authentication service in Pega. Now coming back, let's have it as basic authentication. And then you can also enable the TLS SSL for the REST services. It means you can access all the REST services endpoint URL only using the HTTPS connection. HTTPS stands for Secured Socket Layer. 
and if you have your service as only http then it is going to throw you some kind of unauthorized session error or some certificate exception you may get so definitely in production in all the organization they will be using this tls ssl connection which is always recommended only if you have very low security for example in my personal edition for now i am not going to expose it but i can very well expose as well and that case what i can do is i can just disable it for now tega is going to add me a big red warning i think but it's okay the next is suppress so html all the services like the service rest service so they in turn call some kind of activity some service activity and in activities you can always have some methods like so html method which will present you some user screens whenever we run the report we get some kind of screen right some report viewer screen that is a html screen similarly in activity if you use the method so html it is going to populate you a html screen but for services 100% you don't need this html screen right there is no end user sitting there and invoking all these services it's all at the back end automatically done so you can always suppress so html when you use this option in the activity even if you use so html that step will be suppressed or it will basically commented out so these are all about the context and if you scroll down you can check what are the methods or what are the services that are available as part of the service package currently we didn't create any service so that is why you find it empty but if you open any of the existing service as i show already under the api you find lot of services or the methods that are defined under this service package you can also use this drop down to look into rest so file email whatever services that are included as part of this service package and from this methods block you can also enable the service monitoring and then you can also check the invocation history like how many times it gets invoked if you click from here you will find the details of the invocation history of each individual services and for soap service you also get the deployment descriptor the visdel file to get that i want to open a service package that contains any soap service let me open this and scroll down yeah it contains the soap service as you can see it contains only the service soap if you scroll little down you will get another block the deployment block where you can have your own visdel file if you click here you will get the visdel file so this is the visdel file that you need to provide to the consumers whoever consumes your soap service that is going to be our next module we are going to look into the web services soap so there i will be using this visdel file i'll show you how it gets generated from the service package okay now coming back to our new service package so methods for now it is empty for the new service package and then you go to pooling tab here you define three main configurations the ideal requester the active requester and then it's a second maximum wait second ideal and active are linked together i will explain you with some simple scenarios let's say we expose the customer details from our client's application ideally that is not the case but i'm just saying you customer details is provided by our pega application now a client or a consumer they send in a service request to our application to get the data so what pega does is using the service package configurations it will create a new requester a new active requester will be created now you can think it like a two box you have one box as active and the other box as ideal now the first requester comes into the active box it does all the processing the service requester processing and once it is done it can go to the ideal block so at the end what you will have is you will have one requester at the ideal block because it completed and then in the active requester there is zero so this is how it is going to be now let's say another request comes in there is another one single request comes in so what pega is going to do whether it is going to create a new requester no we don't want to create a new requester because we already have a requester created it is in the ideal requester so what pega will do is it will use this ideal requester you will take the requester from ideal use it and give it back to the ideal so this is how the ideal requesters gets reused so with the requester pooling pega doesn't always create new requesters if there are ideal requesters that is going to get used so that's how pega effectively reuse the requesters now let's go to the third scenario let's say we get three requests now currently my scenario is i have one ideal requester zero active requester now three requests comes at the same time so what pega does definitely it can use this one ideal requester it need two more requester to process the service request so it is going to create two active requesters again so there will be now three active requesters 
processing all the three requests and once it is done all three requesters can move to the ideal requester so at the end there will be three ideal requesters and zero active requesters right now let's come to the final scenario let's say there are 15 requests that is coming in at the same time and i hope you note that we have configured the maximum requesters as 10. now active has zero ideal has three 15 requests comes in what pega is going to do it is going to use the three ideal requesters put it to the active to process it so there is three active requesters here then it is going to create seven active requesters seven requesters will be created so totally 10 will be there it will process only the 10 service requests it is not going to process all 15 it is going to process only the first 10 and the five has to wait before these requesters process they go to ideal as soon as it goes to ideal it will pick the remaining service requests so this is how the requester pooling is going to work active requesters goes to ideal ideal can be reused if ideal is exhausted then active can be created and can be reused but everything has a limit you can specify how many requesters can be there in the ideal as well as in the active so if all the requesters are exhausted definitely the remaining service records has to wait and there you can also configure in seconds how long it can wait before we send out some kind of timeout exception so these are the things which you can configure you can say how many ideal requesters can be there you can say how many active requesters can be there and then you can also say maximum wait seconds before we send out some timeout exception ideally this is always set to 10 but if you have some kind of huge records coming in at the same time then you can very well adjust this requester pooling so let's say you set the minimum and you are getting lot of timeout exceptions what you can do is you can adjust these requester pooling as well as you can also clear the requester pooling how do you clear the requester pooling is from the admin studio if you go to admin studio resources and then requester pools there you can find your service package currently i didn't save the service package that's why i don't see the service package here but you will see the list of service packages for which you have the ideal active sessions and then you can also use this to clear the requester pools and this clearing requester pools may not be enabled for cloud-based applications you have to use some kind of dss for that or pegas cloud will take care of these things but if you are running in your on-premise or local you can very well clear this requester pool now as a final step let's save this service package so we have now successfully created a new service package then as i told tls ssl is not enabled so that is why I throw a red warning at the top i hope you understood now how the service package is going to help with all the services see you in the next module